I'll show the pictures uh, during the church service, but um, we were able to feed uh, about 287 people um, Friday for a week. It's a week's worth of food, and for about $1.75 a, a person is what it came out to. And so, now I'm hooked on that. Um, so we are planning on doing that again before Christmas, and um, we, I don't know what the criteria is for the village that we chose, but uh, 287 people, we had to cut the rations down a little bit toward the end, and they were running out of food for about the last 100 people, but um, the situation was we had a a Bible study that was done uh, by projector. We had one of the videos, uh, one of the Bible study videos that we have done, and so they played that uh, before the food distribution, and uh, eight people were saved at, at, that, at that Bible study. Eight people came forward and asked Jesus to be their Savior. Uh, to me, spending $1.75 on people is worth eight people being saved. And um, of course I posted that online last night and already people were just, there are people who just, apparently their full time job is bashing everything that shows up on Facebook. And so they criticized, they didn't criticize me, they criticized the people who asked Jesus to, to save them saying they only did it for the food and it, that stuff makes me that just makes me angry the food was free yeah they would have gotten the food whether they asked Jesus it so 200 100 287 people 279 of them did not ask Jesus to save them and they got food anyway so anyway that just kind of bugged me a little bit. Um, and the world is still not flat, by the way. I just thought I'd let you know that. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul mentions in verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I, of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. I saw an interesting uh, picture the other day, and I was talking about this on Pastor Mike Online. This is called the Temple of Heaven, and it's in Beijing, China. Now, to me, what's striking about this is somehow, some way. The Chinese, if I'm reading this right, understand that there are three heavens. Because each ring that you see in that temple represents the heavens, one of the heavens. And um, where they got this knowledge, I don't know, because not even the astrophysicists recognize that there are three heavens. They don't know what's beyond where we can see. Uh, I do. I know what's beyond what we can see because the Bible tells me that. But I just thought it was interesting that in their architecture they recognize the, the fact of what the Bible teaches in that, in that there are three heavens. This, of course, is the first heaven, uh, which is the air around us. Let me go back to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth 
And the Bible says, in the open firmament of heaven, meaning that the firmament is not a hard plastic shell or a stone shell or an iron shell or a glass shell or a hard candy shell or a chocolate shell or anything like that. Uh, it is an open expanse of heaven. And that's what Genesis 1.20 is teaching you. Deuteronomy 10.14, the Bible refers to the heaven and the heaven of heavens, meaning that of the first two heavens, the open sky above us and outer space, there is a heaven over even all of that. And 1 Kings chapter 8, which was the dedica dedication of Solomon's temple, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. So, that's the first heaven. This is the second heaven. The expanse of the universe. Does anybody know what the word universe means? What is the word universe? Do you know? One verse. Una means one. United, together, whole. Verse, it's like a verse out of the Bible. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, look at, turn to Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 1, and I'll be reading, I'll start reading in Psalm chapter 18, give us an understanding of our surroundings. That's one of the questions they ask you to make sure you're doing okay. Are you aware of your surroundings? So I want you to be aware of your surroundings today. In about five minutes, I'm going to go pass out coffee to everybody sitting here. You guys look like you could use another cup. Psalm 18, verse 9. He bowed or bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. That's why... The universe or space between us and heaven is black. It's darkness. The Bible talks, calls it thick darkness. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. So in... Uh, Genesis 1, on the second day of creation, when the Bible talks about he separated the waters from the waters, the waters that were above the firmament from the waters beneath the firmament, I think this is more than likely what it's referring to. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Now in Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel along with John are the two fortunate men who were able to see heaven's throne while they were still alive on this earth. I think if I, would, if I were to see heaven's throne while I was still on this earth, you would not get me to stop talking about it. Can I get an amen out of one person? That's, that's better, than, it's better than it was. And um, he sees coming out of the north, he sees... A throne he sees uh, one like the son of man sitting on that throne and uh, he sees the four living creatures and those four living creatures have wheels literally built into their body which is kind of weird but that's what that's how God designed them uh, they are the chariots of God the Bible talks about in the book of Psalms it says the um, how can I see if I can remember this the chariots of the Lord are, are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So God has the biggest chariot of anybody. Biggest limousine, I guess you could call it. Uh, in Ezekiel 1, verse 22, the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And I want you to understand this phrase, stretched forth. It's very important. 
He's, it, it for, it's very important for you to know your surroundings. And I'll explain that in a minute. Verse 26, above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. Uh, if you look up on the screen, that is a sapphire stone. It is sky blue. This is exactly the same color as the sky above us. Now, science tells us that this, well, let me just ask you, does anybody know why in the daytime the sky is blue? Anybody want to take a wild, yes, Aaron. Water of, huh? No. All right. Without any clouds in the sky, at night, the sky is what color? Black. All right. So during the daylight, you're close when you said reflection. Sunlight reflecting on small particles. So I guess you were right. Small particles that are in the air and the atmosphere itself taking the light and refracting it, not reflecting it, refracting, meaning it separates the bands of colors and it gives the appearance that the sky above us is blue. When you take light and shine it through a prism, like a crystal, it separates each color of light, like a rainbow does. And in a rainbow, you have the color blue or the color of a sapphire stone. So, it's the light of the sun ref and going through the little particles that are in the air, and that is separating out the blue band, whatever that would be called, and that's what we see above us. And it is the exact same color as, an, as a sapphire stone, isn't that what it said, a sapphire? Yeah. Did I say emerald a while ago? Emerald's green. But anyway, a sapphire stone, and that is what God is showing us is then a picture of the firmament that separates him from the rest of his creation. That is the same color. Now, Isaiah chapter 40, I want you to turn there. Is any of this important? The answer is yes, because it's in the Bible. Um, and I'll tell you a story. Last night, uh, before I went to bed, I was watching uh, uh, YouTube. I went to the University of Tube. Tube U. And there was a British guy that was interviewing an American man and the man from America was a former flat earth believer. He had his own YouTube channel. He had made videos on the flat earth issue and was promoting it heavily. And then he decided that the earth wasn't flat, which Almost never happens. It's, I call it the flat earth rabies. Because once they get bit by the flat earth, they never, it's like there's no cure for it. And they get pretty vicious about it. But he came out. And um, he had left a comment on this guy's channel, and the guy was interviewing him. This guy was from England. He was from America. And so they were interviewing each other via Skype or something like that. And so I'm listening to this man, and I'm wanting to know what was it that caused him to come out and no longer believe the earth was flat. And let me, exp let me add this to it. When you, when you reach the conclusion that the earth is flat, you have to change everything about the universe. You have to change it in order for it to match the flatness of the earth. 
because obviously the way things work if the earth is a globe doesn't work that same way if the earth is flat. You have to really come up with a lot of things that you have to change in your mind. You have to change physics. You have to change what the sun does. You have to change what the moon is. You have to change everything. And practically everybody that believes in a flat earth believes that there is this hard rock or glass shell and they actually use the analogy of a snow globe. They say the earth is like a snow globe. That the earth is flat and you have this shell over it and God is sitting on top of that shell 3,000 miles away, which I have no idea where they get that number. Chris is back there going. I get it. So, um, as some of you know, I had a friend of mine that decided that he was going flat earth. And I didn't find out from him, I found out from somebody else. And that bothered me. So, I decided to put up a website dealing with this issue from a biblical standpoint. I got a little criticism about that and um, from some of our followers. And I feel like I dealt with the criticism well. I explained to them, look, they're, they're sucking people into this. And they're telling them, they're bullying them into believing that they're not Christians unless they believe the earth is flat. And somebody's got to stand up and say, it's okay if you don't want to believe any of this stuff. So I started making a few videos and, and one lady asked a bunch of questions. So I answered those questions on video. Well, the guy that was being interviewed mentioned my name in the interview. And he said, I don't know if you know this guy named Mike Hoggard, but... He has made some flat earth videos and using scripture to show that it's not true. And he said he made a lot of sense or the scriptures made a lot of sense. And I went, that was me. So in the world we live in, it's not the world that we grew up in. It's not the world 100 years ago. We are facing monumental deceptions because of the internet deceptions that would have gained no ground even 30 years ago now they're gaining ground and they're pulling people in and there are things that are just not true but people say if you don't believe what they tell you to believe then you're not going to heaven you're not saved you're not a christian you're not a bible believer and they give all these things so what does the bible really say concerning the third heaven, where it is, and so on. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? When the Bible talks about, in this case, the foundations of the earth, it's talking about the creation of the earth, the founding of it. When the earth was founded, when God put it in place when he spoke the universe into existence from the foundations of the earth verse 22 it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth now i always took this verse to say that that proves right there the earth is round instead of flat because there is nothing about a globe that's not a circle. It doesn't matter what direction you look at it from, it's always going to be a circle. And for thousands of years, people in history believed that the earth was flat. Some of them came up with ideas like it was a saucer sitting on the back of a turtle the turtle was moving through uh, the heavens and all the earth was on the back of a turtle. For real. A turtle. I don't get that, but that's what they came up with. Yes. Go ahead. They don't. They don't, well, I'll say this, they don't explain anything rationally. Because I've watched their videos. One of the claims they make, Chris, 
is that if the earth were in fact a globe, that every airplane flying would constantly have to be nosing down in order to not fly out into space. You ought to see the, look, you ought to see the looks I'm getting from people. Okay? That's one of the, see, when you, when you believe this thing, you have to start reinventing the world around you. You have to reinvent it. You have to make it up. Because nothing then makes sense after that. So anyway, a globe is a circle. It's a three-dimensional circle, but it's a circle nonetheless. If you look up the word circle, English words mean something. The word circle means round. So he sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. Small. Watch this now. Here's what God did to the heavens. That stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Notice that he said heavens. Plural. Meaning. I would say all three. The air around us, which is huge. The cosmos above the first heaven, which is immensely huge. And then the heaven of heaven. I mean, think about as you go up, each heaven is bigger than the other one. So the atmosphere around us is huge. So much so, we have planes that are in the air constantly, and they almost never run into each other. There's so much atmosphere there. But then above that, we have the, he the heaven over that heaven, which is immensely huge. And then the place where God dwells, think about how big that is. And the Bible says the heaven of the heavens cannot contain God. That's how big he is. And yet... He thinks upon us every single day. Amen? I mean, get excited about something here. Because he thinks about you and he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows the number of atoms and electrons and protons in your body. He knows your thoughts. He hears you when you pray. God is that big and we are that small. So what is man, David said, that thou art mindful of him, the son of man, that thou visitest him? I mean, I've never met the president. I've never met the Queen of England. I've never met the Pope. I don't anticipate that those people would ever pay attention to somebody like me. But the one who is the God of everything knows me not only by my name, but has a new name for me. So he stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. That's God's dwelling place. So I want you to look there on the screen. Um, this little dot right here, this little red, you see that red dot there? That's where we are. Now, this line here is about how far we can see with our Hubble telescope. They say about 13 billion light years, or 12 billion light years, we can see, uh, let's see, pull up this, yeah, that picture there. Each little, one of these dots here is not a star. Each one of those dots is billions of stars, like this here. And they're so big, and yet they're so far away we see them as one little point of light, and yet each one of those dots contains billions and billions of individual stars that are spread out immensely far from each other. So we can see about 12 billion light years from our position here. And yet the astrophysicists theorize that the entire size of the whole universe is way bigger than what we can actually see of it. We have no idea what it is beyond what we can see. Now, my question is to all these astrophysicists who don't believe in God, 
you say that you don't know what's beyond what we can see, but you deny the existence of God, which doesn't make sense. Because you don't know what's beyond that. I believe that God is beyond that. You don't believe in him. But how do you know that? Because you've never seen him. It's my question. So you don't know everything that's out there, and yet you do know that there's not a God. That doesn't make sense to me. So this whole square here is just an estimate of what is beyond what we cannot see. So my question is, if you wanted to get to heaven, how would you even get there from here? How would you get there? It's not like flying up in an airplane. It's not like going to the moon. It's not even like going to Mars. It is beyond even our comprehension of how far away it is. And God said, the Bible, this, this Isaiah was written about 3,000 years ago, and here is God telling Isaiah, write this down, because this is how it really is. The heavens are quite larger than you can ever possibly fathom. And that's where I am. The flat earth people say that that dome, that shell that sits above us is only 3,000 miles up in the air. And that's where the sun is and God sits right on top of that, on top of this shell. It's, I, I just don't, I don't, that's not what the Bible says. In fact, Isaiah 55, turn there. Isaiah 55. God did that. If God's only a few thousand miles away, that's not very far. We can travel a few thousand miles, can we not? We do it all the time. Oh, um, meteors. You ever seen a fall? Who's ever seen a falling star, a shooting star? You know what those are, according to Flat Earth? The piece of the shell that broke off. I didn't come up with that. Anyway, Isaiah 55, uh, I like verse 1. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Everything that we do as Christians ought to be for free. Amen? In other words, don't charge anybody anything. Uh, now, I'm not saying that you should work and earn your living for free. That's obviously not biblical. But when it comes to, should we sell people food? No. We give it away. Uh, should we charge people to listen to our sermons? No. That's for free. God gave it to us for free. We give it to them for free. Salvation is free of charge. And yet, somebody had to pay the price. And that, of course, was Jesus Christ. Now look in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now somebody ought to say amen to that. For my thoughts, listen to this now, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is not a man. God is higher than us. He thinks higher than us. He is capable of thinking way better than we ever thought. The sum of all of mankind put together does not reach how smart and how wise God is. Is it okay to question God? Yes. I've done it many times. God, why did you do this? God, why did you do that? But as far as me telling God, God, you did this wrong. God, I'm angry at you because you shouldn't have done this or you shouldn't have made it this way. I don't do that. If I were God, then I might do that. But I'm not God. Not anywhere close. So I believe that as far as 
This is away from us. That's how high God is and far God is away from us. And yet, Isaiah 40, verse 12, He hath meted out the heaven with a span. In other words, the entire heaven is no bigger than God's hand. And He's got the whole thing right here. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to run through some verses. I actually looked at the number of verses where God says He stretched heaven out. Psalm 104, He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Isaiah 42, uh, thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth. Isaiah 44, 24, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretches forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Isaiah 45, 12, I have made the earth and created man upon it. I even, I, even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. Isaiah 51, 13, and forget us the Lord thy maker that hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. Um, Job 26, 7. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. The earth is just there. What is it sitting on? Nothing. Sitting on, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. Only God can do that. Jeremiah 10. He made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and stretched stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Jeremiah 51, he hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and has stretched out the heaven by his understanding. Zechariah 12, 1, uh, he stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. So three things God does here. He stretches the heavens out. And from what we can, and anybody with a telescope can do this. In the span of their lifetime, you can observe the stars moving away from each other. It's, it's a tiny amount, but a tiny amount in our eyes cast out to how far those are, are away from us. They're still, the universe is still stretching out. God's not done with it. Isaiah, this is, I love this, Isaiah 54. Turn there. Turn your Bible to Isaiah 54. It's a good chapter. If you're in Isaiah 55, you're almost there. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Look at verse 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation, spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. What's God telling you here? He's telling you, make your tent larger. Stretch it out. Make it, make it bigger because you're going to break forth and bring forth. And he's talking about birthing children. Um, think of the number of women in the Bible that could not have a child. And yet, what did God do for them? Give them a child. Sarah couldn't have a child. 90 years old. Now, how many Jews are there in the world? Millions and millions of them from one old woman, 90 years old, who had one child, and yet God has made them as the stars of heaven. So however big Sarah's tent was when she gave birth to Isaac, God has had to stretch it out now and make it bigger to accommodate all of the people of Israel. Um, Psalm 19, turn there. Who's, who's ringing the bell? Did the bell ring? I didn't hear it. Psalm 19. Oh, I think they, I think they sit back there and listen. Whoever it is that does that. Your, your homework this week is to study Psalm 19. Write me a report on it. I ponder Psalm 19 a lot. I think about it a lot. The heavens declare the glory of God. Do you know there's a picture of that in your Bible? The heavens declare the glory of God. It's in Luke chapter 2. You have the stars of the heavens, the angels, the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Okay? That the heavens are declaring the glory of God. 
The firmament showeth his handiwork. The firmament, which is the heaven, and the second heaven, and the heaven of heavens, and how big it is, showeth God's handiwork. The greatest temples ever built by man, uh, gold at its best is not pure gold. In heaven, the gold is so pure, it is see-through. It is see-through gold. And everything in heaven is made of that gold. That firmament showeth the handiwork of God. Amen? Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for making us aware of our surroundings. Making us aware of the world that we live in, the world that you created, the universe, the stars of heaven. Lord, I love looking at the moon, the stars, seeing the sky and the clouds, the picture that you paint every afternoon, every evening when the sun goes down. There isn't an artist in the world that has ever done as magnificent a work as you. Thank you, Lord, for being the artist. Thank you for being the sculptor of this world. Thank you, God, for creating this world and the beauty of it that we live in. And yet, the world that we cannot see is far greater than the world that we can see. We thank you, God, for letting us live in it and for, Lord, the joy that we receive from the world around us. Bless and honor your word. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.